Poddo. This episode was recorded before South Africa commenced its suit in the International Court of Justice against Israel, claiming that Israel was in breach of the Genocide Convention. It therefore did not cover the interim judgment given by that court, which fell short of ordering that Israel should cease operations, as South Africa had sought, but rather confined itself to ordering that Israel should comply with its duties under that convention. That litigation and the judgment of the court when ultimately given will be discussed in later episodes. You're listening to Law and Disorder, a weekly podcast which aims to get to the heart of the big legal issues of the day. Welcome to the third of our uh, podcasts on Law and Disorder. With me at the table are... Charlie Faulkner. Nicholas Morstan. And I'm Helena Kennedy. And we're all lawyers. Nick, though, is much more substantial in that he was a high court judge, uh, (laughs) recently uh, retired. Today, we're going to really have a look at one of the horror stories on our news every night. And one suspects will continue for a long time, which is the war in uh, Israel, Gaza, and the great toll it's taking. And of course, it all started on the 7th of October of last year with the terrible, terrible events in southern Israel, with the attacks by Hamas on a population of kibbutzim and and young people who were at a, a musical festival. What happened there? were undoubtedly war crimes, crimes against humanity. There were undoubtedly atrocity crimes took place on that that day, which will be seared in the memories of Israeli citizens and Jews throughout the world. And any of us seeing and hearing what happened were horrified. But events since have also taken an extraordinary toll on the Palestinian people of Gaza, but also it's spilled over, of course, it's happening in the West Bank and had been happening in the West Bank, horrible things for a very long time too. And so it it really has presented the world with challenges in relation to law. And I wanted us to really have some discussion about it because so often the principles around the laws of war are not fully understood. And I just would like us to try and tease out some of those things in this discussion today without in any way minimizing the full scale of the horrors on the October the 7th, but recognizing the horrors that have happened since that time. I mean, the population of Gaza, two and a half million people, Half of that population are children. And so it's not going to be surprising that in the death toll, over half of those who have been killed have been young children. What are the rules of law that govern conflict of this kind? And there are three sacred principles. The principle of distinction, that is the requirement to distinguish between civilians and their homes and things like hospitals and schools on the one hand, and combatants and military objectives on the other. And then there's the second principle, the principle of precaution, which is that there is a requirement to take all feasible measures to spare civilians, for example, in the choice and means that you use in your warfare, the weaponry you use, is bombardment, dropping bombs on place, which inevitably is going to be indiscriminate, is that the proper way to do this? Or are there other military means? And then the third principle is the principle of proportionality. Ensure that expected or incidental loss of civilian life and damage to their homes and to the infrastructure of a place of living should not be excessive. It has to be set against the military advantage of an attack. And so you have to have a balancing act. If in the Second World War you were going to bomb the place where Hitler was in hiding, that might justify actually the loss of a large number of lives because he was leading such a pernicious and, and violent and vicious regime. But When did these principles come to be formulated? Well, they, they, and they, and they, where are they written down? Well, the laws of war are old and ancient, Nick, but the formulation of these particular principles were honed in the aftermath of the Second World War. And so it it really always surprises me when I hear someone like Grant Shapps saying, look at the bombing of Dresden, you know, thousands and many millions of people were killed. And look at what happened in Coventry. And we can look at past wars, and they were horrifying, the toll of death and destruction. But this was to try and prevent that. 
It was to try and put a responsibility on, on nations at war to behave in appropriate ways. This is all post the horrors yes. that we've known about. And they, they, have, they have meaning. When I was a law officer, the government participated in the bombing of Belgrade in order to stop ethnic cleansing in Kosovo. And every day, the Attorney General and the Solicitor General were engaged in selecting the targets and agreeing to the targets. So, for example, could you bomb an electricity station in Belgrade that would have the effect of cutting off the electricity to hospitals? And the answer is where the law officer said, no, you could not, because it was disproportionate to the aim that you were seeking to yes. achieve. Because what the aim we were seeking to achieve in Belgrade was to bomb the structures that were leading the military assaults in Kosovo. And we were very, very, very restrictive in what was allowed. And the, and the rules of, of war have the most profound meaning in those countries that obey them. But as Helena says, watching, first of all, what Hamas did in southern Israel and they, now they what's going, war crimes, undoubtedly. It's so important to think we have to preserve these rules. But what meaning do they have when people feel their whole existence is at risk? Listen, you have to go back to the business of, and you, Nick, have sat as a judge in cases, criminal cases. I know you were mainly a family judge. Yeah, I, mean, in I did half my time in the non-family work. Yes, and so you did all, all manner of cases, and you certainly did criminal cases. Now, you know that the rules in, on self-defense, people are allowed to defend themselves, whether it's a nation or whether it's individuals. Mm -hmm. But even in, if my daughter were raped, I would want to kill the person who mm -hmm. did it to her. I, I definitely would. The idea is that law restrains the individual behaving in that way. Yeah. And I certainly wouldn't be entitled to go around to the person's house and to shoot them dead. Yeah. Um, I might try and run a defense of mental insanity because of it. But I wouldn't be entitled to take disproportionate action. If one's child were killed by a drunk driver, I yes, would Yes, well, one, one of the things we're going to be discussing in a later episode is whether the voice of the victims is heard sufficiently in the criminal process. Yes. But, I mean, it, it, but what I mean is it starts small. The business of yeah. self-defense yes. moves to nations. Nations are allowed to defend themselves also, undoubtedly. And they're allowed to prevent it ever happening again. So there's, everyone has said Israel is entitled to self-defense. Um, we've had one of the Hamas peoples, a man called Gadi Hamad in uh, Lebanon, said it will happen. They'll be done over and over and over again until we have eliminated Israel. So there's a declaration from some yeah. leading figure saying we intend to eliminate. So it's an existential threat. And so Israel says, and we're entitled to eliminate Hamas because they're going to pose this threat to our people. And one of the basic obligations of a state is to protect its citizens. It is. Yeah. So that's one of the things that we have to recognize. So self-defense around the world, nations said, yes, we agree. Israel is entitled to, to defend itself. It's entitled to take Hamas out. The difficulty, of course, is the way that Hamas operates in this tiny wee place. People say it's as big as the Isle of Wight. I mean, it's a pretty small area. And so what, of course, Hamas have done is that they have burrowed underground and there are all these tunnels, miles upon miles of them. And so that's where they have their military, their armaments and things are kept. And it's also where they sort of do their planning and, uh, and so forth. And so the attempts to get to the military leadership means trying to get under there. Does bombing the whole of the infrastructure on top, is that a requirement in this? Are there other ways in which a military operation could be taken? I know, for example, Charlie, that Israel is has the same as us. There are lawyers sitting there, certainly alongside decisions that are being made about bombardment, about the bombings, and whether it's proportionate to bomb a hospital, for example, if you think that underneath it there might be a rocket, um, silo. A rocket silo or something like that. But I mean, we haven't had any evidence of any of that No, yet. but I mean, just, I mean, Lord Panic always says you test the proposition by taking an extreme example. You yeah. test the validity of a proposition. Say that the Israelis did have valid, objective evidence that there was a really dangerous rocket silo underneath a hospital, what would be their entitlements? I think the frame within which Helena has put it is the frame that Israel is looking at it, which is this appalling series of atrocities that occurred on the 7th of October equals an existential threat to us. What's more, as Helena has also said, Hamas is saying, we're going to go on doing it till we destroy you. Their proportionality is seen in the context, if we don't destroy Hamas, we ourselves are destroyed. And you can't negotiate with Hamas because their position is our prime aim is the destruction of the state of Israel. Yes. They will see that as necessarily vastly increasing 
what you're entitled to do. It's as Helena says, if you were about to bomb a place where Hitler was, and that would bring the war to an end, you might be entitled to kill many the, thousands of people. Then yeah. if you were simply bombing yeah. a place where there might be an armaments factory, you can't kill lots and lots of civilians in doing that. It's this context of we can't negotiate with Hamas. Our whole future depends on it. Don't talk to me about law. Talk to me about survival. I mean, you've got to remember that this would be based on intelligence. And how does Israel get its intelligence? And presumably, people are arrested, you pull them in, and they're interrogated. And we won't discuss how friendly that interrogation might be. But if people are interrogated, and they're terrified out of their wits, and they think that bad things are going to happen to them or to their families, as if, you know, if they don't uh, spill some beans, then they might spill beans that are not exactly accurate. And so they might uh, give information that is that has to be called into question in the ways in which it is obtained and from whom it is obtained. And if it's some kid that's been pulled in for interrogation, then you have to wonder about it. We know that classically the point of a criminal sentence in a domestic case is to have uh, deterrence, is to have rehabilitation, and then also to have retribution. Now, is there a principle in international law that you can retaliate by way of retribution? You, you can't have collective punishment. And so no. let's be very clear. The, the level of retribution of the pain, of, of recognising the pain, pain. Of, the, of the suffered by, by those who are at the receiving end of crime, that has to be recognised in the process of sentencing or in the process, as we have in war, of dealing with that howl of pain that, that was felt after the 7th of October and is still being felt. And there's also a thing that we now recognise much more because we're much more psychologically informed is the way in which things trigger past horrors the sort of post-traumatic stress disorder the Jewish community and the Jewish people and many of the people who are the families of people who were victims of the Holocaust for them and for people who experienced pogroms this was a visit again to the yes. history of their experience but of course what, what's happening to the Palestinians is also triggering horrors of things that happened to them in the past the loss of the yes. destruction of their homes being forced out of the place in which they live and being forced down to the southern parts and regions of Gaza, so it's only a matter of miles away, and still being bombed there. I mean, that's one of the, the things I think has shocked people, is the idea that you give a warning. I mean, it's that business of, are you taking all feasible measures to spare civilians? And what Israel is saying is, we give them warnings, you know, we, we drop leaflets out of the skies that the we ring. hope they'll read. Yeah. Are they written in all the languages? I, I, I'm hoping they are. Do they reach people? Do people in terror, are they able to read sensibly all that's being said? I mean, or do they run around like headless chickens because yes. of the terror? I, Let's also recognise that if you're turning off their communications and many people are saying they're having difficulty getting messages on their phones or whatever, do people get, the, get those warnings? It's impossible to imagine that 20,000 plus deaths feels proportionate. Everybody, you know, who is sort of looking at this in a neutral way thinks what happened on the 7th of October was absolutely appalling. They must be entitled right. to try and stop it again. But the scenes we're seeing in Gaza look absolutely terrible. Do. But does that make one think in this context, where is law? What part has law got to play in any of this? Because they, the Israelis, are fighting for their very existence. And the Gazan people are absolute innocents caught up right. in it. I completely believe that law has got its place, but you're trying to make parallels with the criminal justice system in an ordinary country where we all have an interest Quite. in there being a criminal justice system because we get huge protection by accepting the police and the authorities to crime fighting, not us. But it's, what, when, you're, when you're absolutely fighting for survival and you can do nothing if you're a garden. Put it this way. Where's the law gone? Fintan O'Toole wrote an interesting article in the New York Review of Books recently where he said that Retaliation is a legitimate factor when making a response. However, he said, surely now that 20,000 have died, the retaliatory factor has been satisfied. And so Israel now, the only legitimate factor that Israel can rely on is self-defense. They have to stop themselves, as they would see it, from being destroyed by an enemy that will not talk to them. I mean, one of the problems here is that you can hold two truths in your heart at yeah. the same time. Yeah. And you can, on the one hand, I mean, I feel this and I, and I say this to my Jewish friends, 
what happened and the raping of young women and the horror story of setting fire to people and the, yeah. the whole That's barbarity of, of that, that, something that was, the was, 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 was so horrifying. But you can also hold in your heart the idea that many of these people are just barely surviving in Gaza and they are being obliterated. They're also starving now. They're also having the water they have is contaminated and so people are now mm-hmm. getting cholera. Children are dying of, of just diarrhea, dehydration. The winter's coming. They're now inadequate tents. And the horror of all of this is back to this business. What's the rule of law? It has to be that somehow those who are not raw with the pain on each side, people on the outside have to be saying enough is enough. But I couldn't agree more with that. I also think the real importance of law in a situation like this, which is so raw, is there will come a point when people look back on this and you have to have a measure and the law is an important measure yes. as to whether what you did was acceptable in any way. So if you look at a Nuremberg, everybody said that's Victor's justice, it was more than Victor's justice because Nuremberg, the laws that governed Nuremberg, were very much the creature of what had gone between yes. the two wars. It was not just, we'll get the Nazis. It was... These are some principles that we will try they, to apply. They were establishing principles. And I mean, some people were acquitted. And it was a great moment, and in fact a great moment, in terms of yes. the contribution that great Jewish lawyers made to the development of it was law. was retrospective I mean, law. Raphael Lemkin talking yeah. about genocide and creating yeah. that, that with the crime of genocide and it being part of the discussions and debate at that time, but also the whole business of, of Lauter Pact. Yeah. Both of them lawyers, funnily enough, from Lvov. Yes. Philippe mm. Sands has written so brilliantly about it mm. in East West Street. But how do they get around the retrospective aspects of it? Well, I mean, there was a, there'd been a great debate that had been going on throughout the interwar period about whether, the, for example, aggression was a, a war crime yes. and there had been a series of inter- international treaties, Germany had signed up to a number of them, Mm -hmm. saying aggression was a war crime. In the sense of retrospectivity, the leadership of these countries knew that that was a feasible crime. The other other thing was, it's so interesting to me, because I'm doing some work on war crimes in relation to Ukraine just now. And one of the things that people are saying is, why are you bothering with this just now? This could go on for some years. The thing is that during the Second World War, actually, for some years before Nuremberg, they were already large numbers of lawyers. They were working yeah, on it for yeah, years, Jackson, for Jackson years. Jackson was working on it for a two, number of years Several years, years before, two, three years. Yeah, I mean, before, and yeah. so were lawyers in Britain and so was yeah. so was Lauterpacht and people yes. were working on it. Instead of the crime of aggression, they were calling it a crime against peace. Yes. Yeah. And that's why, of course, there's now a call for that to be done in Ukraine. But sadly, there's a, a resistance to it coming from certain quarters because they feel that, well, it's hard for the United States of America and Britain to be calling for a tribunal to try Putin for the crime of aggression. But because it's, of, because it's, of the it's Iraq the, War, of Charlie. Course. I mean, the Iraq War is a, a burden that still sits around the shoulders like an albatross. What the United Nations Charter says is you can only use force either with the permission of the United Nations or in self-defense. Right. And the justification for going to war in Iraq was a United Nations resolution. Subsequently, most lawyers now say that resolution did not justify the use of force in Iraq without there being a further resolution. Well, we were saying it to you at that time, darling. You were definitely saying it at the time. And that was the, the great debate. Assume, for the purposes of this debate, that that justification did not exist, i.e. it was not possible lawfully under the international law to go to war in Iraq, to invade Iraq as we did without a subsequent resolution and there was no subsequent resolution. Does that make all the people who did it, the government of the United Kingdom at the time, of which I was a part, or President Bush, war criminals? I don't think that it does because they legitimately believe that there was a justification for it. The people on trial in Nuremberg were convicted of knowingly waging war in Europe and beyond, knowing perfectly well there was no justification. And the only justification was they wanted to aggrandize I think the have, imperial I empire of Germany. I, and we have to distinguish between, on the one hand, who are war criminals 
and what's against yes. the laws of war. Listen, or the I, use of I'm, force. Not, I'm not going to rehearse again the, the whole of the Iraq war travesty. I do think that legal advice was being given that this was going to be offending against the principles and the laws of war. And it was um, under a certain level of pressure that uh, a change was made to the advice that the Attorney General eventually gave. We know that. It's do well documented. And, uh, and the person who documented it very well was Philippe Sands, received and got hold of the original advice, which within a period of eight days was changed changed by Peter Goldsmith, and it's still not been fully understood can, can as to I, why. If you look at the advice that was given at the time, mm -hmm. and it's the advice that runs through advice on use of force, and it says there's a reasonable argument, that's the language, that you can rely on the United Nations Security Council resolution without another one. Mm -hmm. Now, I think the first thing that needs to change is because of all the things that governments do, using force against another country is never going to be subject to court approval or not. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And once you've done it, there's no going back. The idea that you can do it on the basis there's a reasonable argument, brackets even a reasonable argument you, feel, you think is going to fail, is ridiculous. Because lawyers spend all their time saying, well, this is a reasonable argument in the sense that it won't get struck out by the judge as being completely hopeless at the outset, but it might fail. And we can't have that anymore as a basis for going to war. And that's been the traditional basis I, for years. It was the basis The that difficulty is that, I mean, with all of this, is that what people drag up always and are going to drag up is that all the nations have a history which is never very clean. And there's always stuff that can be pointed at as the behaviours, which therefore, you know, how dare you criticise Israel? How dare you criticise Russia in relation to when you yourselves have done Meet terrible and things? But there has to come a line in the sand somewhere to say, Moats listen. And beam. Yes, moats and beams, as, as, as one of the Israeli advocates has said. But listen, a point has to come where you, where you do say, the world has learned from the past. Why can't we say enough is enough? It's not a question of throwing people in front of courts. It's about somehow using the collective strength of nations. And unfortunately, the United that Nations depends is a so can I on consent. Whereas the criminal yes. justice system within the UK has is, consent. Is international law, particularly the circumstances in which force is used, should be governed by law and your interest in it being governed by law as a nation is the higher, the weaker you are as a nation. Yeah. So Russia, China, Israel, they want as little constraint as possible. The small countries want as big constraint yes. as possible for obvious reasons. You know, if you said to America, you're going to be constrained by international law in the circumstances in which you, you're going to use force. They'll say, of course, I accept that. They will say that. But then will they be constrained? Well, they I mean, or they, they if they don't... think matters of high policy are best dealt with, you can completely understand that the Israeli government is saying, we are not going to have our response dictated by lawyers. We are going to have our response dictated by our very survival. But it does mean that other nations have to find other ways of exercising their, their if you like, impact by, for example, not providing armaments that are going to destroy yes. whole communities, and also by not giving in to the notion that there can't be humanitarian aid. Got yes, I mean, all that. There, but also is, the way you review these things in the past, there will come a point when, and I don't know, it'll be after terrible suffering, where the current crisis yes. in the Middle East will at least get into some sort of equilibrium. And then looking back, just as we look back on the consequences of the breakup of Yugoslavia, where people ended up in The Hague being tried, those leaders paid a price in the end. They did. I, th I think that, that um, one of the things that will, might do it will be if there were evidence of the killing of the main military leader of who Hamas. is there, of, of mm. Hamas in yeah. Gaza. There are people in sitting in the Four Seasons Hotel in Qatar who are the kind of political leadership and sitting outside in Lebanon and places. But the, the military leader is placed there in Gaza and I think that they need to have a head that they can produce Mm. to say we have killed the head of this serpent. And that's what they, that Israel wants to be able to do. And I, mean, I don't they, think until that happens that they will they will make concessions. Both in relation to Hamas and in relation to the Taliban, over a long period of time, the military strategy was kill the leadership. And the leadership were repeatedly killed. 
And in repeatedly order. replaced. Yeah, exactly. Of course. Exactly. And that's like the problem about this. Exactly. Does the ICC have any jurisdiction in this conflict? Yes. And the ICC will... Because I Israel mean, hasn't signed. Well, it doesn't matter because the Palestinians have. And so there are, there are matters in relation to the crimes that were committed by Hamas. Already the chief prosecutor, Karim Khan, went there, but he made it very clear and gave a warning also to Israel that it would fall under his purview. And the other thing that's, that is here is that you've got to remember there are other things that constitute war crimes. The business of bombing hospitals is a particularly sensitive thing. I mean, you've got to be able to protect and protect things like, you know, medicines on frontier and, and the doctors who are in there doing things. And I'm afraid there hasn't been enough of that going on in this um, bombardment. But the other thing is that you're supposed to look after political prisoners. You're supposed to allow the Red Cross in to see political prisoners. And there's a, been a real concern, of prisoners of war, prisoners of war have been taken from Gaza. People have been arrested. Young people have been because they want information, you see. Yes. And so they've been taken into a particular detention camp and the Red Cross has been refused access to them since October the 7th. Now, that is an, a crime against that, that, articles a, within the Geneva Convention. The old ones. And the old ones. The business got, of, got... of protecting prisoners of war has gone back in, in the eons of time. So, you know, we've got to remember that some of these other things, cutting off people's access to water, mm. to food, to mm. starve a population, well, I mean, this is um, the... all these things constitute war crimes, turning off people's electricity so that survival becomes a problem. Now, I can understand that Israel is saying by having electricity, it's possible to live underground. You know, there's air conditioning down there yeah. there's, and uh, and there's the lighting that's down there and so on. We haven't talked about the hostages. I mean, the business of the hostages is absolutely horrifying to take hostages and to have them buried in those uh, yeah. tunnels underground and not to be releasing them. So that is a crime that continues used to be committed by Hamas. Atrocious. and But also, we have had all this battle around the business of where a word can make a difference, and we as lawyers know that, but the business of a ceasefire, a temporary ceasefire, a pause, a truce, words are being played with in order to find the right words to allow a space to be created, to get food and needs into these people. And then how do you do that without it all perhaps being taken into for other purposes? But can I come back to the, the essential question we started with? I mean, is this actually a matter of law or is it just a question of good practice? I mean, laws must be capable of being enforced. I mean, that's the essence of law. It's, yeah, of course. I mean, the business of enforcement and accountability it has to be a central element in law. And what we do know is that up until now, it's been self-policing. The, Depends the, on the, consent. The, the, it really has been about people exercising their own constraint and the outside world seeking to constrain and restrain um, those who are involved in this war. And of course, we've sought to do that in relation to the Russian-Ukraine business. And here we are trying to do that externally, but without being seen to take sides. It becomes a heartbreaking exercise. Unfortunately, we also have to talk about the absence of very good leadership because the Palestinians have been very poorly led. I'm afraid Mr. Abbas, aged whatever a great age he is, should be stepping down and making way well, have, for when much... When was the last time they had elections? And they don't have elections and so on. And that's all a disgrace. And then you have the whole business of Hamas, therefore, being able to enter into a leadership role, yes. both in Gaza and growing in the West Bank. Yes. And we know that Hamas is not about democracy, and they're certainly not about, about equality and giving women their share in leadership and so on. And I'm afraid that misogyny runs through. But the rule of the, the, the international law does not draw a distinction between democratic states and other states. No, it doesn't. And the problem about international law is the strongest people in the playground are the people who've got to enforce it. But let's yeah. if, they, if they don't want to enforce it, they don't enforce it. What are the means by making them, in a sense, have an interest? in international Let's, law yes. being enforced. But, and that's the great, great difficulty. What's happening in Israel and Gaza at the moment is absolutely raw force is determining absolutely everything. But, it's completely wrong. It is absolutely heartbreaking to watch it. And what is left... You see, if there isn't accountability, you, you, if there isn't accountability, these sores live in the hearts you, you, of people you, forever. Uh, ha they don't feel they've ever received but justice. But that's politics. And I mean, there, yes, politics. Yeah, that is politics. But look at... I've, I've spoken about the poor leadership in the Palestinian side, but the poor leadership on the side of the of the Israelis is also an issue. Uh, just to draw not. this to... We, we began with your three sacred principles, 
Do these appear in any kind of international statute, or are they just basically the, uh, expressions 19, of sort of customary principles? There's a 1957 well, Geneva Convention. I so. But there's a well-established... I mean, the things that Helene's been talking about are the treatment of people in the context of war, yeah. which is one aspect of it, and those are the three principles. Yes. But there is the other aspect that we've been talking about in the latter part of this discussion, which is when can you use armed yes. force? But, but, and that is, that is set out in the UN convention and convening yes. statutes. But, but, but let's just for a moment pause, because in the aftermath of the Second World War, which was, you know, which everyone said was to be the war that would end all wars, you know, yeah. that it was yeah. it was so horrifying. The Holocaust, the millions of, of, of Jews who were exterminated. And of course, it was it also were people who were gay and people who had disabilities and all kinds of other horrors in that war. The, also, the, the bombings and the and the destruction that went into yeah, it and the killings right. of so many people. And, and it certainly, the generations who remember that stuff are going. We're at the end of those who fought in those wars, our fathers. Yes. I don't know about yours, but certainly my father was, was, mm. was, uh, was too. Si- actually nearly seven years away in war. And so the mark of all of that in our lives re- was retained. I now have children and grandchildren. Will they have any real sense yeah. of that? And so I think that to some extent, the thing that tra- where an effort was made to bring humanity into law and a set, set of values that would spread across the globe creating the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, creating far stronger terms on which wars could be conducted, if ever, but an acceptance that you couldn't have pacifism, that you were entitled to defend yourself, but it had to be with constraints. The idea that you had a a convention to protect those who would be moved out of their nations and and might lose their place because of it. So therefore the Refugee Convention and so the Genocide Convention created. All those things that were to create a set of laws that would in some way constrain all of us and the yes. and the less humane parts of us. But the terrible thing is, it seems to me that we're losing a sense of all of that now, well, but, but, that rules-based order. My parents' generation accepted, as their parents had, that going to war was an occupational hazard of living in the country in which they lived. My generation and my children's generation would think having to go to war is utterly unacceptable yes. and a failure. So you're absolutely right as it were, the generation that's slightly younger than us don't recall the horrors of war, but equally they would resist so deeply, Uh, as they did. Conscript them. I mean, it'd be very hard. Look, at the Vietnam War was brought to an end because the American public would not stomach their people being sent and to Harold die Wilson, in Vietnam. And Harold right. Wilson felt, in a similar way, did not back it because he felt that his own people would not, for a war that was so far away and so distant and, and so on. And had such little impact on yes. the immediate... On the immediate lives yes. of, of this country. Exactly. But, but, but we it's won't interesting, tolerate but war what, But it's interesting in watching, what's that? watching what's happened, though, in Ukraine. Conscription has taken place in Ukraine, but it's not been without its difficulties because there are young people who don't want to be conscripted and men are not allowed to leave Ukraine. Yeah, no, there is a restriction on men leaving, and therefore there's very great care looking at your passports, looking at visas, passports of yeah, men yeah. as they are as they are travelling or anything like that. Yeah. And so it's a novel thing. I think that the people now have got a clear conception that, that such a thing as international law exists. And that it's worthwhile. And that it's worthwhile. And that we must support it. Now, we haven't dealt with the problem. And the problem is accountability. That these laws can exist, but there's still a strong feeling that what is international law worth if it doesn't mean that there's an outcome that people who do offend against these crimes that have been committed are never brought to book for them? It seems to me that up until about the end of the Second World War, the laws of war only seemed to be about the treatment of prisoners of war. But they, people did have a clear idea that there were rules about the treatment of prisoners of war. I was watching Saving Private Ryan on Channel 4 the other night, and the Americans caught a, caught a German prisoner, and they had a tremendous debate about whether they could shoot him. And they, they decided not to because it was against the rules. But they shot him anyway. But they shot him anyway. But they ha- there was an idea, even existing then, that there were rules about the, the but there's a, of war. The, the, there's a and, world of difference between the rules of war, which everybody, the big nations have, a, have an interest in protecting their soldiers against yes. mistreatment and their civilian populations on the one hand, and on the other when can a country use force? Exactly. And for the big countries, 
they're saying, I'm not going to be restrained exactly. by law. Big also is not relating to size. It's no. relating to power in the universe. And the sense and, of and, oneself. And, and that power, you can be a small nation, but incredibly powerful, as Britain is, yes. as Israel is. Yes. And so it's not necessarily about size, but it's about your power. And your power gives you the opportunity to say, shove off, get yeah. off my back to other nations who are saying what you're doing is wrong. The use of force is a way that many countries use to project important in the world. That's been a fascinating episode. Thank you both very much, and we'll all be back next week. You've been listening to Law and Disorder with Helena Kennedy, Charlie Faulkner, and me, Nicholas Mostyn. The show is produced by Nick Hilton for Podo. Our theme music is by Anthony Willis. Please subscribe to get new episodes straight into your podcast app. We'd be delighted to know what you think of the podcast, so do please email us your thoughts on lawanddisorderfeedback at gmail.com. See you next week.